Hey everybody, you've got Nader al Naji here, creator of the DSO blockchain. Now, it's only been about a couple of months since our last update, which I'm going to link in the description below, but so much has happened both with DSO and with the broader market that it felt like a good time to go over everything we've done in the last two months, but also to set a roadmap for everything we want to achieve in the next few months and go over that together. Now, this video is a little long, uh, so we're going to put chapters in the description that allow you to hop to whatever part of the video that is most relevant to you or that you care about. Now, with that, I'm going to jump into a doc that's going to allow us to go over everything together. All right, so I have this doc, which I'm going to link in the description below. Uh, and I'm going to start with just going over the topics we're going to cover. So first, I'm going to go over DSO and our mission, just as a reminder, for about 30 seconds. Uh, then I'm going to recap everything that we achieved in the last two months. It's actually everything that we said we were going to do in our last video, which again is linked in the description below. Uh, I'm going to go over what we're going to do for the next few months, or the next quarter or so. I'm going to talk about what we can improve on. And then I'm just going to go through some riffs on some other topics that uh, people have told me they want to hear about. Things like uh, stable coins and the collapse of Terra and others, uh, the macro environment, um, the broader crypto market, and uh, the future of the US dollar, which is very exciting. Um, all right, so with that, I'll dive into our first topic, which is DSO and our mission. Just kind of a reminder, um, in case you forgot, DSO is the only blockchain built to power storage-heavy applications like social applications. So if you try storing 200 characters on any other blockchain, uh, even the most advanced ones like Solana, Avalanche, and Polygon, it's going to cost you 25 cents to a dollar just to store those 200 characters, but it's virtually free on DSO. Um, now, why is that? You guys probably know this at this point, but that's because those other blockchains are built to power what we call finite state applications or storage light applications. Um, so just to give you an example, DeFi is a finite state or storage light application. And the reason why it's like that is uh, anytime you and I send money to each other, we're not actually increasing the storage required by the blockchain or the state that's required by the blockchain. You and I could send money back and forth a million times and all we'd ever need to store is two account balances that we just keep updating. Those are finite state applications and that's what those existing blockchains can power. But when we want to power something like a social application, that's a completely different ballgame because now every post, every follow, every like, every transaction actually creates new data or new state that we have to store on the blockchain. That's called an infinite state application. And that's what DSO can power that other blockchains can't. Um, and that's why storing 200 characters on DSO is so cheap. It's built for that infinite state use case. Uh, and why is that important? Well, you guys know this by now, but uh, when you can power infinite state applications with a blockchain, uh, social is kind of the first interesting thing that you can disrupt. Uh, you know, today, a handful of companies basically control most of the information on the internet. You know them, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter. Uh, but DSO, by virtue of putting all that content on an open blockchain, can move us from that centralized world uh, to one where anyone can build their own feed algorithm, anybody can launch a social app without having to solve the cold start problem, uh, and uh, you can have thousands of apps to choose from instead of just three uh, created by you know a handful of uh, large corporations. Um, and so you can really bring competition and innovation back to social media. Um, but aside from that, just to go back to crypto, you can actually expand the reach of blockchain tech and crypto from finite state applications to infinite state applications, um, which is just everything from social to marketplaces, anything that increases the storage with each transaction versus keeping the storage constant. Those are things that DSO can do that other blockchains are not designed to do and don't do very well. Um, yeah, and if you want to learn more about infinite state versus finite state applications and DSO's advantages, we have this blog post here. Um, I also talk about all of this, and uh, I go into detail on layer one strategy and how we're going to grow DSO uh, in this YouTube video here, which is, uh, which is our last update, essentially. So you can go into that. Okay, uh, and with that, I'm going to just give a recap of everything we've done in the last two months. Now, it's probably going to be hard to believe that we did all of this in two months, but it just goes to show we move really fast at DSO, uh, uh, Team DSO. Uh, and um, I think that's why it's such a promising uh, time to be involved with the project. Um, so first, uh, we launched an app called DowDow. It's actually the first app that we've launched since BitClout over a year ago. And it takes everything that we learned about BitClout uh, and essentially refines it, makes it better, uh, and covers a new use case, which is DAOs, uh, or generally uh, raising money from the internet. Um, it makes raising money much more efficient. 
Um, and if you want to learn about DowDow, you can watch this tutorial here, uh, or you can read the vision doc here. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll let you do that. Uh, I'm not going to go into it in this video. We've talked about DowDow quite a bit in, in uh, other content. Um, but yeah, extremely exciting. Um, I, I am also, uh, so I'm not going to talk about data specifically in this video, but I'm going to talk about all the things kind of behind the scenes that power doubt out that also any other app in the DSO ecosystem can use. Um, so the first really exciting one is a fully on-chain, non-custodial uh, order book exchange. So uh, again, because DSO is... Uh, and it can power infinite state applications, you can actually put a whole order book exchange on the DSO blockchain, which is kind of crazy. Um, and it's extremely efficient. It can handle 50,000 transactions per second. It's built with a key value store on bare metal. Um, that's one of DSO's advantages is you can actually build on bare metal rather than having a virtual machine between you and uh, what's happening on the on disk and all of that. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and the complexity of this was really high. Uh, you know, uh, comparable to Serum, Serum or Radium on Solana or Uniswap on Ethereum. Um, and uh, honestly, if you just look at it, it's beautiful. So DowDow has the first implementation uh, of the order book exchange, which is pretty cool. Um, and uh, all of this is on chain. So all of these orders are on chain. They execute really fast, really efficiently. Um, and uh, it's also an extremely high engagement uh, page, actually, this uh, the trade page on DowDow. Um, and you can click through all the other DAOs that are raising which is really cool. Um, so yeah, just a super uh, high ambition, uh, high high uh, 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 effectiveness project that it's going to be really good for the ecosystem. Okay, so next we have social ERC20. So everything you trade on the order book actually has a kind of social component to it, which I'm which I can show you. Uh, so if I go over here to DowDow, uh, just to trade trade wallet, um, you can actually see that uh, the DowDow coin um, has a profile picture, and if you click here, you can actually see that it has a description of what it's doing. Um, it takes a second to load here. See, it has a hero image, description of what it's doing with Markdown, all this stuff. Um, and that's because with DSO, you can actually attach social information to your uh, coin, to what people would trade uh, on something like ETH. It's kind of like if you merged ENS with pictures, with high, again, DSO's can power storage heavy or infinite state applications. So you can store pictures on chain and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so that's DSO's social ERC-20 standard. Um, and uh, it's what essentially is behind the scenes powering uh, uh, DowDow the, 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 and the on-chain order book exchange. Um, and it's just really cool because we took one of DSO's big advantages, which is the ability to have an identity or a profile on chain, and we attached an ERC-20 standard to it. Uh, essentially making it uh, much, much better, um, which is really cool. And um, the other thing I'll say about DSO and the kind of compounding that's happening um, is everything with DSO is inherently social. So uh, you can see the order book here. You can actually see the active traders. Uh, you can click here and um, it'll sort them by how much volume they're generating and things like that. Um, it does take a second here. I'll just give it a minute. There you go. Uh, yeah, you can sort everybody by how much they want to fill. Uh, and if you see someone who has uh, maybe a large position, you can actually click here, go look at their holdings, and then uh, DM them um, on uh, on Diamond or on uh, a different app here, and uh, maybe do an OTC deal or something like that. So um, essentially everything with DSO, the on-chain profiles, the on-chain order book exchange, um, uh, the fact that your assets are on-chain, everything like that, uh, is all compounding and coming together to create better products than you can on those finite state blockchains where you can't have a profile or you can't store all this stuff on chain. And the best part is that any app can actually utilize uh, all this data and all this information. If you want to go out there and build a better exchange uh, UI than DowDow, if you want to build something that uh, you know doesn't show any of this information, uh, you can do that. And, and, um, and it's totally open for that. Um, great. Moving on to uh, another thing we shipped, uh, Hypersync. So before, uh, DSO, DSO nodes would download the download and verify the entire history uh, of transactions, but now they actually just download the current state when they sync from other nodes. They can do this in a sharded way, uh, which is extremely efficient. Um, and it basically took our sync time down from eight hours for a new node booting up from scratch to about 20 minutes, which is really, really cool. Um, and uh, I do want to mention, um, you know, if you want to think about the complexity of something like this, it's actually very similar to Ethereum's purge uh, step, which comes 
after the merge, you know, they're not even on the merge yet. So it's actually not going to happen until 2023. Um, and, uh, you know, with these, so we've been working on this for maybe three or four months, but we ship, shipped it fast. And um, it's one of the most advanced uh, syncing mechanisms. It's actually state of the art. Um, and uh, it also computes a, a checksum. That's an online checksum, which we call elliptic sum. Basically invented a bunch of cool math to make it work. Um, but the short of it is, uh, nodes can sync in 20 minutes, uh, where they used to take eight hours, which is great. Okay, so I'm going to blaze through a few of these really important changes. Uh, the first is derived keys and spending limits. So this is really cool because, um, you know, you might be familiar with MetaMask, where you have to approve every transaction uh, that happens. Well, that doesn't work for social applications. Um, if you want to have a social application, then you kind of need people to be able to do lower value things like like something or follow people or things like that without having to open an approve pop-up every time. Seems like a small thing, but it's you, you think about it, and it's absolutely in integral uh, to making easy-to-use apps that compete uh, with Web2. And uh, derived keys enable this. So with, with this uh, change to the DSO blockchain, again, it's at the layer one level you have to make this change, um, you can actually approve certain transactions, uh, some transaction types, uh, and the number of times you want to allow an app to perform them uh, using this derived key thing. So essentially what happens is uh, on chain, you say, I'm going to make this new public key, this new public private key, uh, and I'm going to give this key the permission to post on my behalf or to like things on my behalf, but not to spend money on my behalf. Uh, so you can do that. Um, and an app can actually do that where it creates a derived key, gets your approval uh, for basic things like posting, and then posts, you know, you can use that app to post, uh, without actually having um, uh, the risk that it's going to take your money or anything like that. Um, and if you want to cut that app off at any time, all you have to do is go to your wallet and uh, cut off its permissions. Uh, just like if you use PayPal or something like that, you basically turn off subscriptions uh, and that's that. So honestly, you know, it's hard to imagine Web3 apps being competitive without something like this. And yet you actually have to go to the layer one level uh, to to be able to do that, you have to to do be able to do this. You have to control the wallet and the layer one, and you have to have a focus on um, again storage heavy applications or applications that do these kinds of transactions. Um, cool. And then some smaller, maybe smaller stuff. Uh, adding metadata to uh, entries, things uh, profiles uh, can have whatever metadata apps want to add to them. That was something that was really important. Uh, a lot of upgrades to how NFTs work on DSO. Um, including buy it now and things like that. So DSO NFTs are officially ready for prime time. Uh, they're ready for integrations into the big boys like OpenSea. Um, and uh, yeah, just again, just blazing through all of these updates. Uh, we launched DSO.js, which is this amazing library that any application uh, developer, anyone building an app on DSO can embed with uh, just really one line. They install it uh, and then they embed it. So here, I'll show you the login. It's these four lines. And you get to do everything that I just talked about, everything that DowDow is doing. You could build an app like DowDow with just Web2 tools. You don't have to know smart contracts. You just literally put these four lines in your app and, uh, and everything just works, um, which is amazing. Um, and you can do everything. You can do posts. You can do uh, uh, NFTs. You can do um, things with, with uh, DAO coins and the social ERC-20s. You can even do order book exchange transactions all with just Web2 APIs. Again, I think we have like the best APIs I've seen to do all of, all of this kind of stuff, uh, which is just great. And it's it's getting better every day. Um, next thing that we made progress on uh, is proof of stake. Uh, so uh, basically state of the art uh, proof of stake is coming to do so really soon. It was actually blocked by hypersync. And now that hypersync is complete, uh, we can do this. We've made a lot of progress. I'm going to talk about that in the next section about what we want to do next quarter. Um, we have a MetaMask integration, which uh, wasn't actually even mentioned in our last video, but uh, it's going to ship soon in the next couple of weeks. And what it enables is people who have um, MetaMask wallets uh, or ETH wallets, basically with one little approved pop-up, uh, they actually can log in and use any DSO app uh, rather than using the DSO native wallet. So uh, what's cool about that is it enables integrations with things like OpenSea and Rarible and all these other NFT platforms very easily. So any platform that has a lot of people who have MetaMask wallets 
uh, this basically smooths over the integration uh, of DSO with them. You basically never even have to see DSO, and yet you're going to be contributing content to the DSO chain when you have comments. Let's say when OpenSea adds comments, that's going to contribute content to the DSO chain, uh, and uh, uh, any transactions uh, that involve the social stuff also contribute to the DSO chain, like tips. Uh, and all of that is po made possible by the MetaMask integration. Um, I should mention it also enables hardware wallet support. Uh, so if you like using a hardware wallet, well, MetaMask has that. And by integrating with MetaMask, DSO has uh, hardware wallet support automatically out of the box, which is uh, really awesome. Um, the last thing I'll say that's really cool is when you uh, log in with MetaMask, we actually have the ability to uh, know what your if you have an ENS uh, address or if you've set up an ENS identity, we actually pull that into DSO and pre-populate your DSO profile with it. Um, so basically, with one click, uh, you can start using DSO as your identity layer uh, on ETH. Um, and uh, and we think DSO, via this MetaMask integration, really has the potential to be the identity layer for all blockchains, not just DSO, but also ETH, Solana, all these others. Um, so once we see how the MetaMask integration goes, which I'm sure it'll go smoothly, uh, we're going to do Phantom as well for Solana. Um, and again, it's, it's easy to underestimate it, but all of that's po only possible with derived keys and spending limits, which you can only really do, again, if you control the layer one and you're focused on storage-heavy applications. Um, otherwise, you wouldn't be able to do uh, a kind of delegation of your keys the, uh, that's needed to have an integration like this. Um, cool. And then... Um, yeah, just to a couple more small things. Uh, improved wallet onboarding. Um, so if you check out the onboarding on DowDow, it's really one of the best uh, uh, setups. Uh, it's using the latest and greatest DSO identity. So if you don't do the MetaMask login, you of course can use uh, the DSO wallet and integrate the DSO wallet. Uh, and if you come here, uh, I'll just show you what it looks like. Uh, you can either create a, a new account or uh, sign up. If you sign up with your email, um, that's really easy, uh, and it's literally one click, and you're already there. I already have an account, and it reloaded that. Uh, but if you want to make a new account, uh, which I could, you can also do with your email. Um, it's just not showing it here. So let me, I'll do it the hard way with the seed, just to show you. But normally, you'd, you'd click the email, and it would work. Uh, so here, what's cool is uh, any app that embeds the DSO identity iframe uh, can essentially get free starter DSO uh, for their people just by entering their phone number. Uh, so if I enter my phone number here, which I'm not going to do, because then you would see my phone number, uh, you get free DSO, and then you can basically post in an unlimited amount uh, on any app. Um, it is important to mention that uh, with the MetaMask integration where we don't have the free DSO, we actually uh, give free DSO based on if you have ETH in your wallet, works just as well, and you don't even need to enter your phone number, uh, which is really cool. But, um, but, you know, for the native DSO wallet, where you have to get started, uh, you know, it's as easy as creating an Instagram account. Um, and with DowDow, we actually see that 95% of people uh, enter their phone number and get the free DSO. So it's a really, really smooth flow. Uh, for anyone who wants to get started building a Web3 app, they just drop those, those four lines for the identity iframe in, um, and they pass a flag, and then people can get free DSO when they start their app, which is great. Um, and uh, yeah, and one app that's using all this stuff is DSOFI. Uh, so DSOFI is a mobile-first iOS app. It's third-party. It's not run by us, not run by the DSO Foundation. Um, and uh, it launched last week as well. Uh, and honestly, if you want to try one of the best experiences in Web3 social, like social Web3 experiences, try DSOFI.app. Everything you do is on chain. And uh, your post, when you post on DSOFI, shows up in all the other apps on DSO. I will remind you of that. Uh, which is amazing because that means people on other apps gives you tips and diamonds and all that kind of cool stuff. All right, so that's a lot of stuff to do in just two months, right? Uh, well, with that, I'm going to go into what we want to do for next quarter, which is super fun. Um, all right, so the first thing we we're going to focus on is proof of stake. Uh, it's probably our highest priority. I mean, a lot of high priorities, but this is one of the higher ones. Um, we've essentially completed a full survey of every proof of stake proposal uh, out there. Um, I and uh, a few people on our team have basically been uh, well, they've been full time, and I've been I've been part time on it. Uh, and um, yeah, everything from uh, ETH2, Tendermint, Solana, everybody. We've looked at every single proof of stake out there, 
Uh, and uh, we have some opinions on uh, what can be improved. Um, and we're kind of incorporating all of that stuff into a final design uh, with a lot of state-of-the-art twists that I think are going to be hopefully pushing the whole space forward, which is going to be really cool. Um, and I think this is a moment where it's important to remind everybody that, you know, we are technologists, like the big part of us at DSO. Like, I'm an engineer. Uh, again, you know, computer science undergrad, you know, DE Shaw, Google, all that stuff. So this is... Uh, one of our biggest advantages is the ability to push the space forward uh, on the hard tech, um, not just on the product side. Um, and so once we finalize our design for proof of stake, uh, by finalize, I mean we have a draft that we're like, okay, we feel really good about this. Um, we're going to be getting feedback from top crypto researchers. Uh, so we're going to be meeting with the people at Andreessen and uh, all the other funds uh, who specialize in uh, uh, you know, proof of stake and general consensus uh, algorithm consensus mechanisms. Um, and yeah, once we kind of socialize that with them, get their feedback, iterate, we're going to be publishing our next generation uh, proof of stake proposal. Um, and uh, hopefully um, in the next few, uh, by August is kind of when we're really trying to uh, get something out there that is a concrete proposal um, and uh, optimistic that, that we can do that. All right, so that's proof of stake um, for, for the DSO chain, um, which is going to be really exciting. Um, uh, the next thing I want to mention is USDC bridge on DSO. Uh, it's actually ERC-20 bridge on DSO. I should uh, fix that. But it's most valuable for USDC, as we'll explain. So um, DowDow is essentially going to be the first to support this, but you're going to be able to uh, move USDC uh, onto DSO, onto a DSO native wrapped USDC, uh, and the benefit of that is you can transact with zero gas. Uh, and uh, that's actually going to be very useful for DowDow uh, in order to support primary uh, rounds fundraising where your treasury is uh, USD rather than um, uh, DSO. Um, now, the reason why that's so valuable is imagine you want to do something like buy the Constitution. You want to raise money to buy a collectible. And this literally happened. You know, Constitution DAO raised $50 million. But they had the problem with the volatility of the Ethereum. So they raised with Ethereum, and so the, the value of what they raised was going up and down. And it limited uh, how aggressive they could be with their bid because they uh, had to deal with that volatility, right? If they could have uh, raised with USD backing, um, it would have allowed them to go all the way up to their maximum. And who knows? Maybe they would have won if they were, they were able to do that. Um, so uh, USD Treasury on uh, uh, DowDow is going to be really exciting. Um, and all apps can use uh, the wrapped USDC to do whatever it is that they want. Um, DowDow and other apps can expose it to the user as just USD without getting into the complications of wrapping and all that stuff. Make it really simple. Um, and of course, once you have wrapped USDC on DSO, you can uh, use the Mega Swapper. Uh, to go ETH, Bitcoin, Solana, uh, and DSO to wrap USDC and back and forth. Um, so yeah, so this is this is valuable um, uh, because it allows you to fundraise, again, with a stable currency, which is important. Um, but it's also valuable because it allows you to uh, cash out, uh, you know, your DAO coins or your trading profits more easily. Um, you know, as we get DSO listed on more exchanges, that's not going to matter as much. Uh, but in the short term, um, you know, USDC is uh, something that's really easy for people to transfer in and out. Uh, and I think it'll result in net inflows uh, into DowDow uh, and into DSO. Um, now, uh, and I, just before we move on, on the uh, USDC uh, to wrap USDC and, and Treasury in USD, all of that, uh, you know, you just want to talk about the strategy behind it a little bit. Now, um, when you allow uh, primary sales on DowDow to use USD, uh, you know, that actually gets more people uh, to want to use DowDow. You know, it's one of the bigger things, especially when we talk to established DAOs um, that they want. That's just the killer feature for them. Like, it, you know, they would move today if we had it. Um, and so, uh, but what's cool is um, even though USD can be what people fundraise with on DowDow, um, DSO is most likely going to remain the dominant base pair on the exchange. Uh, and so the end result of adding uh, USD uh, uh, Treasury to DowDow and generally to DSO is we think there's going to be more DSO activity on the trading side and also locked up uh, in essentially orders on the exchange uh, and things like that. So 
overall net more DSO activity, uh, more things that essentially generate fees for the DSO blockchain. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's kind of the strategy behind uh, adding USDC for Treasury. All right, um, the next really big priority for, for us uh, is actually a first class long form DSO client. Um, and uh, basically, uh, we think that there's a lot of thought leadership that's not happening on DSO because all of the apps today are optimized for short form things like Twitter. Um, so we think that a medium competitor on DSO um, is, a, is a really exciting thing. It's a great thing for the ecosystem, but also it's just kind of needed. Like we think a lot of people will, especially in crypto, will uh, gravitate towards it. Uh, so we are prioritizing that. Um, there are a couple in the ecosystem um, that we're either going to work to iterate uh, or we're going to launch our own, um, depending on uh, how fast uh, the rest of the ecosystem moves uh, and how reliable everything is. So, uh, but you know, in you know, in a couple months, um, there's going to be a really exciting long-form play uh, on DSO, um, and uh, yeah, that's what we're prioritizing. Um, Cool, Discord killer. Uh, so DSO already supports on-chain encrypted and unencrypted group chat. Um, it's important to mention that it's first of its kind. No other blockchain supports that. Again, that's partially because it's DSO is the only one that can support infinite state apps. Um, and that actually opens DSO up to have a Discord killer. Um, we actually think that DowDow can be that. Uh, we, you know, with DowDow, um, we saw. Uh, the highest engagement page was the uh, trading page. But beyond that, uh, the feed is actually the next highest. Um, and it's arguably on par with all the activity that's happening in Discord today about Dowdow. Um, you know, every few minutes, there's a post about Dowdow in the Discord. So the first step is basically going to be creating a kind of global group chat for Dowdow uh, that we know everybody wants based on their behavior and uh, uh, what they tell us in Discord. Um, but that's actually going to work uh, across DAOs. So essentially, if you go to any DAO, uh, you know, like let's say you go to uh, Supernovas or something like that, um, you're actually going to have a little message box. You'll be able to DM them. There's kind of a group chat uh, uh, with the people who created the DAO. Um, and on the main feed page, uh, you're also going to have basically a uh, global DAO, DAO level group chat, but also each DAO will, will have its own kind of Discord-like experience. Um, and because we're DSO, because we're a blockchain, you actually can tip on messages. So you can actually get money when uh, people like your messages rather than uh, just having likes or stickers or whatever. Uh, and uh, hoping to do much more than that soon, but um, that's what we're gonna start with, which is already you know kind of something you can't do anywhere else. Um, Cool, we talked about the DSO MetaMask integration. I'll just emphasize that it really does enable integrations with the NFT platforms, right? So adding a comments section um, to something like OpenSea or Rarible or Coinbase NFT and more, all of that gets enabled by this DSO MetaMask integration, which hopefully will ship in the next couple of weeks, uh, and hardware support, which is um, really important. Another thing a lot of people have asked us for is uh, an offline public key generator. So basically something that you can run on an air-gapped computer that uh, generates a seed phrase and the public key associated with it. You know, kind of surprising we don't have this yet, but um, just something that we're going to prioritize. People in the community have made versions of it, but again, we just need to audit it, make sure it's really secure. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, this is actually more of a kind of business development task, but um, it's really important for Dowdow to succeed um, that we actually bring people on, hire people who, whose only job really is to build an external pipeline uh, of people launching DAOs on the platform. Um, so we've already started that. Uh, we have someone joining us uh, who's going to start uh, late July. Um, and uh, But, you know, we're uh, aggressively doing it in the meantime. Uh, lots of conversations with founders of DAOs, what they want, moving them over. Um, and so I would expect to see a lot of activity uh, coming from those efforts in the next couple of months. Uh, okay, so um, that's for bringing DAOs in from the outside. Uh, those are people with existing DAOs or people who are thinking about fundraising. Maybe they're not thinking about a DAO, but uh, you know, we kind of talk to them and, and push them in that direction. Um, but we think that the real unlock for DAO DAO uh, is going to be, uh, and by the way, unlock for DAO DAO and unlock for the DAO space in general 
is showing people the patterns that are possible uh, with a tool like DowDow. Um, so the first pattern we're going to demonstrate is a collectible DAO, um, and uh, we're going to launch PokéDAO. Um, so we're already already spoken to a few people in the Pokémon community, uh, Pokémon um, trading card game community in particular. We have a sneak preview of uh, what it's going to look like, which you can see in this doc. Um, but uh, overall, this uh, pattern that we're going to do to launch PokéDAO uh, is going to consist of us raising money, buying cards, minting those cards as NFTs, uh, and then sending the cards, physical cards, to the winners of the auction, um, and then repeating, essentially. Uh, and what's cool about that is every time the NFTs change hands, the DAO earns a royalty. So, you know, it's more than just that primary sale. It's actually all subsequent sales. Um, and if we keep doing it and doing it and doing it, um, we can actually make DSO, uh, DSO NFTs in particular um, the dominant place to transact in collectible items. Uh, well, Poke, Pokemon cards for PokéDAO. Um, but there's no reason why someone can't do the exact PokéDAO playbook for uh, something like uh, baseball cards um, or Magic the Gathering cards or something like that. Um, so we're hoping that we inspire people with what we're doing with PokéDAO. Um, and uh, yeah, that'll be uh, uh, something that a lot of other people can replicate very easily um, if they're uh, a little bit motivated. Um, oh yeah, last thing I'll say about PokéDAO, which is fun. Um, we're not sure yet, but we're thinking basically uh, we, we, we do this thing where we buy Pokemon cards and mint them as NFTs. And we do it for the first original 150 Pokemon in first edition form. Uh, and uh, it's just kind of fun because we all get to like catch them all together, basically can catch all of the, the first 150. Um, I collect the Pokemon cards when I was little, never was able to get all 150, but here now we'll be able to do that together. Uh, and uh, it'll be fun. Um, there are other DAOs, DAO patterns that we want to launch to inspire people. Um, we're still looking for a good media DAO. Uh, a media DAO is where you raise money to make some kind of uh, seri series or a movie or something like that. Um, we're actually talking with CIA uh, and their financing uh, department to see if there's something interesting we can do there to kind of show people how it's done. Um, same thing, still looking for a good game DAO. Uh, that's where maybe you launch a demo of a game or a concept, raise money, make the game, uh, sell it, distribute back. Um, there's a ton of interest in people who want to launch VC DAOs or company DAOs or SPAC DAOs. Um, but, uh, you know, we're basically, our top priority for that is to work on a legal framework, basically, that anyone can uh, use. And the, the top priority is to safely be able to uh, use an existing structure like equity in a company um, and wrap it in a DAO so that you can access the essentially trillion dollars of crypto market cap uh, that can access it when it's on DAO DAO versus in the traditional market. Not to mention the liquidity of having a coin associated with it and all of that. Um, we just have to make sure we're being thoughtful about it, doing it right, um, and not triggering uh, security status with those. But I'm optimistic, actually, that we'll be able to come up with some clever stuff. Um, and it's important to remember that one of the biggest edges that we have is all of my experience in my last company, um, going with lawyers, spending about $10 million on lawyers uh, to figure out what's a security, what's not, all of that. Um, and uh, even with DowDow, even though it's not our first rodeo, I probably spent more time on the legal side of things to make sure everything is compliant uh, than I did on the, the raw product and tech side. Um, so I'm confident we can put all of that to very good use here. And I actually think there aren't that many teams in the world that have the expertise needed um, to push the space forward, even on something as simple as a collectible DAO uh, or on a product like DowDow. So that's great. So there's more stuff to come here. Uh, pretty excited. Um, and the last thing I'll leave you with on um, uh, creating DAOs and, and the nature of DowDow uh, is that um, the future of early stage financing, I really think, is DowDow. You know, um, it's so much more efficient. You can invest with any currency. You immediately get liquidity on uh, uh, what you contribute to. And um, yeah, it's just, I think it's better in every way once we kind of crack uh, the patterns and once we crack uh, the legal framework for uh, things like venture capital funds and companies. Okay, next priority, uh, hiring a COO. I'm very confident this uh, search will be closed in the next couple of months. 
Uh, but it's really important. So we're, we're about 15 people total right now with the DSO Foundation. That's a team that works on the DSO blockchain, also works on DowDow. Um, and uh, a COO will essentially help us scale the non-technical side of DSO. Um, you can tell my background is engineering. Obviously, I have management experience. All of that's good stuff from my last company and also from being at Google. Um, but, uh, you know, someone with a, a lot more experience is going to be really great to have. Uh, as a partner um, and someone who can really uh, scale up uh, our operations. So if you know anyone, uh, let me know, let us know. Uh, and uh, you, know, you can hit at DSO on, on uh, Diamond App or DSOFI now, uh, or you can hit uh, at DSO Protocol on Twitter and uh, we'll take a look. Um, but um, yeah, so uh, this is the job description, which you can click into here. Um, and the most important things are uh, the preferred experience at the bottom. So experience uh, with technical concepts, ideally technical undergraduate degree. That's just something important. If you're running a blockchain, you have to have that background. Um, so high level strategy and roadmap uh, and execution on that. Zero to one uh, experience managing 10 to 100 people is very good. Culture setting um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, crypto concepts obviously are, are important for them to be familiar with as well. Um, great. And uh, that job description's in there. Okay, Bla uh, blazing onward, uh, DSO bells and whistles. Uh, so um, these are just a lot of things we're doing uh, around the DSO blockchain uh, that don't really fit into any other category. Uh, redesigning the DSO website. Uh, we own DSO.com, uh, which uh, we're going to redirect and uh, uh, kind of announce with big fanfare, uh, which is going to be great. Uh, reducing hypersync memory usage. We actually recently got it down to 33 gigabytes. Uh, so we're going to push those changes. Um, it's important to note that other blockchains have really high memory usage. Things like Flow have 512 gigabytes of memory required. Uh, Filecoin needs 125. Uh, so it's really remarkable um, how little DSO needs. And again, its capabilities are significantly uh, bigger than these other, other chains um, with those infinite state apps being possible. Um, blob storage. Uh, so this is actually interesting. Um, uh, if you want to store a video or an image on DSO, you can do it, uh, but it, it can be a lot more efficient. We call that blob storage. Uh, so just um, re-architecting a little bit to make it even cheaper to store that large uh, media and make it really fast to serve. Um, NFT bidding with any uh, DAO coin. Uh, so DAO coin and social ERC20, we use interchangeably. Uh, we call our version of ERC20, we call them DAO coins. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so you're going to be able to bid on NFTs with any uh, social ERC20, any DAO coin. Um, and the reason why that's cool is you can actually use USD to bid directly on DSO NFTs, uh, which um, you, know, you can't really do on other platforms. Um, hypersync on Postgres. So DSO runs on a bare metal uh, key value store, uh, which is extremely efficient. Again, it's why all of these infinite state apps are possible. But a lot of developers like what's called a SQL database uh, or Postgres. Uh, and so taking our innovations with HyperSync, uh, we can actually use everything we've innovated with HyperSync to run DSO on a Postgres database uh, with, again, with a very short sync time. It won't be 20 minutes. It'll be a little bit longer. Um, but adapting that to Postgres is going to be great for developers and enabling them. Um, associations on chain. So associations are kind of like verifications, but they're a more decentralized version. We'll be talking about those a lot in the next few weeks. Um, email my followers capability. Uh, so um, something we hear from a lot of people on DSO is they want to be able to, um, when they make a post, it emails their followers or something like that, or people can subscribe, unsubscribe, but all on chain. Um, so we have a clever way where when you follow someone, you can actually encrypt your email uh, to them. Um, and it's all fully decentralized. Um, and then that gives people the ability to email all of their followers immediately um, uh, in, a, in a kind of self-custody kind of way, which is really cool. Um, reactions on chain. So basically, instead of just a like, you'll be able to uh, do kind of any emoji or any, uh, any kind of reaction you want. Uh, and the standard is going to be thumbs up, thumbs down. But, um, you know, you can do whatever you want, which is really cool. Any app can implement whatever it wants. And blocks on chain. So when you block someone on DSO right now, uh, the on-chain implementation is clunky, got to optimize it. Um, yeah, so those are all the DSO bells and whistles. Um, a few optimizations for DowDow. Uh, so DowDow uh, 
you know, we need NFTs added to the UI. That's going to be quick. Some trade page cleanup. Uh, notifications can be uh, uh, a bit better. Um, and then some other things that are still a priority, mainly just other listings. So um, DSO is currently on Coinbase, Ascendex, and Blockchain.com. Uh, we are talking to other exchanges about listing, most notably Binance, uh, and uh, hoping to move quickly with them, uh, more quickly than we've been. Uh, but, uh, you know, everything just shuffles around with the bear market, and uh, uh, but we're pushing on it really hard. Um, another one oh, I didn't put here is uh, a coin split. Um, so I don't think we're going to get to that in the next couple of months, again, especially with proof of stake and everything that's happening. Uh, but uh, it is still a priority to essentially create... Uh, uh, a split for DSO, maybe a 1 to 100 split or 1 to 1,000 split, uh, so that each coin can be a bit cheaper. Uh, we notice with DowDow that people really like it when coins are like a penny. Um, it feels cheap. Uh, it doesn't change anything about the economics, but again, psychologically, um, it uh, uh, gets people more excited about your currency. Okay, and with that, uh, I'm going to move on to uh, next section, which is what can we do better? Um, it's really simple. Most of the non-technical side of the DSO Foundation uh, is underinvested in right now. That's why we're hiring a COO. That's why it's so important that uh, you guys help us with that search. Um, but yeah, marketing, business development, and partnerships are all things that we need to be doing more of. Uh, and general awareness. So um, a lot of people still don't know about DSO, even though it's more advanced than basically anything on the market, <laughs> um, technologically speaking. Uh, and that comes down to the fact that our marketing uh, and our uh, business development haven't been strongest. Uh, but you can also help us uh, by just generally spreading awareness, share this video, or share uh, your thoughts on everything that we're doing and the future of social media. All right. And with that, uh, I'm going to jump to uh, my thoughts on various other things. Uh, so... Um, yeah, so I'll start with stable coins. Um, so very recently, a very large stable coin named Terra uh, collapsed, um, and uh, it was an algorithmic stable coin uh, where instead of being backed one to one with dollars, uh, it was um, actually uh, uh, backed by well, initially the uh, uh, Luna, which is like a volatile kind of Bitcoin-like asset that they created, um, but then they converted that to Bitcoin, um, and uh, when Bitcoin crashed the backing was uh, no longer solvent. Um, and uh, the reason why this is interesting, why a lot of people ask me about this and why I'm including it in this video, um, is uh, my background uh, originally was in al algorithmic stable coins. Uh, and um, a lot of people don't know that uh, I and, and my co-founders uh, with Basis uh, invented the uh, algorithmic stable coin category. Um, so I'm very sorry about that, uh, that, it, that it's caused so much um, uh, uh, you know, struggles for people um, with Terra collapsing. Uh, but um, it can be a very interesting model. Um, and so I'll just comment on Terra, its pitfalls, and kind of the future for the algorithmic stablecoin space, uh, since, again, that's something that a lot of people um, ask me about. Um, so with Basis, when, when, when we created it, uh, we actually uh, had a white paper, uh, which I'll show you, and you can read it at basis.io. You can also see why we shut down Basis. Uh, but um, you can see here, this was our white paper, an algorithmic central bank. Uh, and so um, it's an alternative to backing uh, uh, a stable coin. Instead of backing it one-to-one -one with dollars in a bank account, um, you would back it with a Bitcoin-like asset and over-collateralize it. So you basically could have $10 of your Bitcoin-like asset backing uh, you know, each dollar of stable coin. Um, now, why would you want to do that? <laughs> why would anyone ever... Uh, want to use a stable coin um, that's not backed by dollars. Um, well, when we started Basis, it's important to remember that um, stable coins were not a thing. Uh, Tether was the only stable coin on the market, and it had about a 40 million, with an M, million market cap. Uh, today, Tether is over 40 billion. It has competition from USDC, which is another one-to-one -one backed uh, stable coin, also in the tens of billions. Um, and Basis and the algorithmic stablecoin uh, uh, category has a major advantage over these other approaches, which is that uh, it can be done in what's called a censorship-resistant way. Uh, so you can run an algorithmic stablecoin um, and not be subject to uh, someone shutting down uh, your banking access uh, or a bank just you know refusing to serve you or 
uh, losing your money or something like that. Um, and the reason why that's relevant is um, when I started Basis, we actually didn't think that dollar-backed stable coins would exist. Uh, you know, we were actually betting explicitly against that. Um, and if you assume that there is a world where uh, dollar-backed stable coins cannot work, then the algorithmic approach is actually all you've got. Um, and moreover, the algorithmic approach uh, uh, to doing a stable coin, again, because the alternative is no stable coins, uh, that approach would be what would enable all of DeFi. So all of futures, all of the lending, all of that stuff. Uh, I really think it would be built on an algorithmic stable coin if it was not uh, for the feasibility of one-to-one -one dollar backed stable coins. Um, so at basis, we faced a difficult turning point when it turned out that it was possible for someone to build a dollar backed stable coin. Um, that was a difficult moment for us because now we go, okay, wait, how does an algorithmic stable coin compete against the dollar backed stable coin, given that the dollar backed stable coin is perceived by the market as less risky, right? Um, quite the conundrum. Uh, and our conclusion was, okay, well, we can offer upside. So we can offer interest on the stable coin uh, to get you to hold it. Um, you know, you can pay that, that stable coin in that Bitcoin-like asset. Uh, in that case, the uh, Terra's version was Luna. We, we called it the share. Um, and by the way, everything is inspired by basis uh, one way or another, um, which is kind of crazy to see it play out many years later. Uh, but, um, but anyway, so if you want to compete with the dollar back stable coin as an algorithmic stable coin, you need to offer something to make people switch over. Uh, and the most obvious thing is upside, so interest on the stable coin. Um, okay, so you play that out and you're like, okay, cool. I have to offer interest on my stable coin, on my algorithmic stable coin, if I want to have even a shot at competing with the uh, one to one dollar backed stable coins, uh, given that those are generally preferred by the market. Uh, and you play it out and you say, okay, well, you're not just competing with those other dollar backed stable coins, you're competing with all the other people who are going to launch algorithmic stable coins against you. And we had tons of clones, including Terra, uh, you know, or people just competing with, with Basis. Uh, so on the interest, you actually have to compete with every other algorithmic stable coin uh, in terms of how much interest you're going to pay. And if you play that out, it's what's called a race to the bottom, where the stable coin that becomes the most popular, the algorithmic stable coin that, that, that becomes the most popular, is probably the one that pays the most interest and therefore, ironically, is the least sustainable or the least stable, right? Um, and so um, that's kind of how we thought that the algorithmic stablecoin space was going to play out. Um, it's quite tricky because, you know, I, I raised $140 million to launch Basis. Um, and, um, you know, it wasn't obvious that uh, there was going to be a race to the bottom, that you had to run it in this kind of really high-risk way. Um, but at the same time, you know, it's, 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 a, uh, it's a, a tricky situation. It's something that, um, you know, especially when there's a backdrop of, um, you know, a lot of regulation and, and you want to make sure that you launch in a compliant way and, you know, don't want to lose people's money and things like that. Um, uh, it becomes a game that's, that's not obviously uh, fun for anyone uh, who's launching stable coins to play because you basically have to choose between um, again, running it at, at a relatively risky level uh, or potentially not growing uh, and not, com not being competitive. Um, and it's important to note that there are a lot of stable coins other than Terra um, that run, you know, algorithmic stable coins that run with like very, very non-risky settings um, that, that have done, you know, okay. Uh, but again, Terra is the one that everyone knows about. It's the one that got the biggest, again, because it ran its interest the hardest. Um, so anyway, funny thing, the most popular algorithmic stable coins, probably the one that's the least stable, ironic, um, and uh, that, you know, might continue to be the case. I I'm not sure. I don't know. Maybe now uh, 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 people understand this and the equilibrium shifts. But um, anyway, yeah, those are my thoughts on stable coins and uh, especially algorithmic stable coins. Okay, and with that, I'll just uh, move on to give uh, some thoughts on the macro environment. Um, I don't have too many interesting thoughts here. A lot of this will be stuff that, um, you know, most people are familiar with, but people wanted my opinion on it, so just going to go through it. Um, so basically, the, the Fed, uh, the Federal Reserve, is dumping a bunch of assets right now. 
Um, imagine the biggest whale in the entire world, like they, the, someone with like all the money in the world decides to just dump everything they have onto the market, like sell it. Uh, that's kind of what's happening. You know, the Fed has all these uh, assets on its balance sheet that it's selling. Um, and uh, usually people refer to this as raising interest rates. Uh, but that's actually the same thing as bonds uh, getting less valuable. So the Fed essentially sells all of its bonds and all of its assets on the market, devalues them, increases the interest rate of those assets. Um, but yeah, and why is it doing this? Well, it's essentially to make the dollar more valuable, right? Uh, so you can think of it, again, when you raise interest rates, uh, your people move their dollars uh, into those assets that now pay higher interest. Um, but uh, you can also think of it as the Fed, you know, when it takes a bond off of its balance sheet and sells it for a dollar, uh, you know, that dollar's no longer in circulation, right? It replaced it with a bond. Uh, either way, the dollar gets more valuable. Um, and that means that all other assets that are priced in dollars get less valuable, right? Uh, kind of makes sense. Uh, and, um, you know, for whatever reason, uh, so-called risk assets uh, go down in value more than non-risk assets. Uh, and that's just because, you know, people are scared of, of uh, volatility. So they'll pull out of things like Bitcoin into things like corporate debt or uh, something, or maybe even uh, government bonds, things like that. Um, and um, yeah, and, and it's important to mention that, um, you know, that, you know, I think is, uh, people agree, is kind of at the heart of everything that's happening. Um, and the one thing that I would mention about it is... Um, this compared to like previous cycles that I've kind of been a part of, and again, my history is much less than someone who's older. You know, I kind of uh, saw 2008, 12, 13, 14, you know, that kind of stuff, but I didn't see 99 and all that kind of stuff. Um, but this cycle compared to the other cycles feels much more uh, controlled. You know, there's not really a, a something wrong with the system. It's actually kind of the system doing what it's supposed to do, which is when the dollar is devaluing, um, you know, the Fed takes dollars out of circulation um, or raises rates, as you, you could say it. So it feels like kind of under control uh, compared to other cycles. But again, what do I know? Um, yeah. And then the last thing that um, I'm not really sure about, a lot of people probably know a lot more than I do about it, uh, but it's whether it's a supply shock or a demand shock. So what I mean by this is, um, you know, things are going up in price, right? So for example, oil is really expensive. Um, but how much of that is because the dollar has devalued versus oil is actually just more scarce than it was, right? Um, cars, for example, are more expensive, right? But is that because the dollar devalued or because we have a problem in the supply chain for microchips, right? Uh, so I think that other people have much better opinions about this than I do. But um, if it turns out that it's like more of a supply shock, uh, you know, in, in the sense that the supply chains are just messed up and they're going to get fixed and all of that, um, then that actually is kind of nice because it means that the Fed won't have to, uh, you know, um, do as much dumping to prop up the dollar, essentially. Um, but either way, you know, this is a part of the game. This is how it works. You know, when you're holding something like crypto, uh, whether it's DSO or Bitcoin or whatever, um, it's going to go down, you know, it can go down a lot. But as long as you focus on where the real value is being created, and as long as you focus on continuing to create value, which is what we do at DSO, uh, it all works out. And in the next cycle, uh, you know, you bring back all those gains uh, and more. Uh, you come back on all those losses and more. All right. So with that, I'm going to cover uh, just some thoughts on the broader crypto market. Um, and, um, you know, it's something that people wanted me to comment on specifically. Um, so, uh, one thing is, uh, that we've seen is, um, Bitcoin has actually held up a little bit better than, uh, a lot of the other cryptocurrencies on the market. Um, and I think that's because, you know, Bitcoin, um, really all it's trying to do is be a digital gold, um, it's, it's like store of value, uh, uh, use case. Um, it's been very focused about pursuing that. And when there's turbulence in the market or when there's, um, uh, uh, flight to safety, as it's called, um, you know, Bitcoin, again, because it's so focused on store of value, I think is going to be uh, that safe haven asset. Um, and that's been um, good for DSO's treasury. Uh, you know, we have a lot of DSO, but we also have a lot of Bitcoin. Um, uh, but, you know, obviously it's been bad for uh, other cryptocurrencies, you know, not just DSO, but also, you know, Ethereum, Solana, and everybody else. 
Uh, and, um, you know, that again, it's kind of, uh, I think, one of these things that comes with the cycle. Um, when the uh, uh, flight to safety happens, uh, Bitcoin, with its kind of safer uh, narrative, uh, does better. Uh, but again, you know, at the beginning of the next cycle, uh, that's when people, I think, start looking at, um, you know, things that are trying to do more than just store of value, trying to change the world. Um, and ultimately, I think if you do well uh, as a, uh, 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 a network or something that apps get built on, you can actually go back and, and kind of claim uh, store of value, which is going to be pretty cool in the long game. Um, so, yeah, so I think that's why, you know, Bitcoin's down less than everything else. It's really just focused on store of value, and that's caused it to be viewed as a safe haven asset um, in, this, in this downturn. All right, so I'm going to finish off with uh, just talking about DISA's place in the in the crypto ecosystem. Um, so um, you guys have heard me say this a million times, uh, but I'm going to try and explain it a little bit differently than I normally do, um, which is that, uh, especially with the integration of MetaMask and uh, the potential partnerships with NFT platforms and all that kind of stuff, um, I really think DISA can become the identity layer uh, of crypto. Um, and, you know, as crypto kind of grows and grows and grows, uh, it, I think it can be kind of the identity layer of the world eventually, right? And um, you guys have heard me say this, but you basically get, how does this happen, right? How do you get to be the identity layer of the world? Well, it all starts with getting one killer app. Uh, and I, I actually say a viral and retentive app. So an app that spreads, but that also retains its users. Um, and as you know, with DSO, uh when someone joins your app, they don't just have assets. They don't just have their, their wallet balance on there. They have content. They have their profile, their identity on it. Um, so uh, there's much more stickiness there. There's much more value for developers to unlock uh, by building off of DSO when all of those uh, uh, key kind of pillars are there. Uh, so yeah, so very simply, one viral retentive app brings a lot of users, wallets, content um, onto the DSO blockchain. That entices developers to build on DSO. Uh, and uh, launch apps that bring more users in a virtuous cycle. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think really any layer one blockchain is going to um, pursue a strategy like this where they find that one killer app that then brings more devs, that but then brings more users. Um, but I think DSO is special in that it can really expand the scope of what people think of when they think of a crypto network, namely from those finite state applications to infinite state applications, right? So where other blockchains can really only be kind of like a Visa or at best, you know, New York Stock Exchange, DSO can add things like Facebook, like Amazon, like all these other applications um, that are really, really interesting. Um, and there's so much to be gained uh, by having those. Uh, and again, it all goes back to being the identity layer of crypto as uh, an important wedge, uh, an important stickiness, uh, an important attractiveness for developers to uh, build on DSO. Um, and uh, I do also have a, a fun little post on how much you can actually make by being uh, Facebook or Amazon, uh, but Facebook in particular, where you can charge per post uh, and the kind of economics on that, they're actually quite good, if you, even if you don't consider uh, all of the other ways that DSO uh, can charge fees on what's happening on this blockchain, um, right? Like the transfers, like the uh, exchanges and all that kind of stuff. All of that adds up to an extremely valuable network, right? Uh, and one that, again, expands the scope of what people originally thought or think of as crypto networks. Um, and uh, so the last thought I kind of want to leave you with that kind of ties all of this together um, is to ask yourself, uh, you know, what is the market going to look for when all the craziness is over, when the cycle is over, when uh, it starts again and we go from safe haven to the next big thing <clears throat> being what we want to pursue, right? What's the market going to look for, right? Uh, and we think it's going to be DSO, blockchains like DSO, that can power infinite state applications, you know? Um, and, uh, you know, it's kind of like how with Bitcoin, we just had send and receive, uh, ETH and Solana and all these others really enabled finite state applications, those financial applications, right? What are people going to look for in the next cycle? I think it's the blockchain that can power uh, social applications, the blockchain that can power marketplaces, the blockchain that can power all those things that require the storage that you can't actually do uh, on the existing blockchains today.
All right, so that was a bit long, uh, but if you stayed until now, then you are definitely one of our true supporters. So thank you so, so much for being a part of this, for being part of this project. Um, I said this last time, and I'll say it every time. The story of DSO is one of continuous and nonstop iteration and compounding. Uh, you know, be so good they can't ignore you, and the market will catch up. I really believe this, uh, and that's why uh, we're going to keep pushing really hard. We're going to push through the bear market. Um, and uh, I'm really excited for you to be a part of this as we continue to grow, continue to push, uh, and eventually uh, change the world. So thank you so much. Again, really appreciate it. And until next time, see you later.